So uh, the way that we say Merry Christmas is Nadolig Hyawen, Nadolig Hyawen, uh, which literally translates to Merry or Joyous Christmas Time. Uh, and then we have Bluidin Newith Tha, which means Happy New Year. Bluidin Newith Tha. We have Kvarchion Tamor or Bendithion Tamor, which both mean either blessings of the season or like season's greetings. Hello, mystics, and welcome to the Occult Unveiled. I'm your host, Ashley Ryan. And today I have the Welsh witch with me, Mara Starling. She's an author, a teacher, and a genuinely joyous person. Welcome to the show, Mara. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. <laughs> uh, I am so excited too. I've been watching your TikToks for a while. You are so entertaining and so informed. Oh, thank you so much. I try to be at least. <laughs> So for some of our listeners who may not be familiar with you, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Where did you grow up? I'm originally from a little island that's at the very tippy top of North Wales. And okay. I think Wales is uh, a country that is often overlooked and doesn't really feature in many people's minds. I remember mm -hmm. when I went to university, I had um, numerous international student friends who were from overseas, and many of them didn't mm -hmm. even know that Wales mm -hmm. as a nation even existed before they met oh. me. So <laughs> it's rather insane. Um, but I, yeah. I grew up in uh, Anglesey, North Wales, so a little tiny island, and in a tiny little village called Aberfrau, which was a coastal village. And it was also mm. a fully Welsh-speaking community, so everybody oh. in the village spoke Welsh as their first language. And that's a feature of Wales that a lot of people don't realise, is that we have our own distinct cultural identity, mm -hmm. and we also have our own um, language. I grew up just immersed in the culture of Wales and in in the folklore and mythology and magic of Wales. And so it's no wonder really that I grew up just obsessed with so much of what is now magic and witchcraft and such, because a lot of the uh, elements of magic and fantasy and mythology and such that is so popular in uh, the greater world nowadays across the world is very much um, inspired by a lot of our magical and mythological traditions as well. Well, it sounds like you had such, oh, like a magical childhood and a magical life and, and growing up in a place that has such a rich history. And that's why we're here today. We're going to be talking about Christmas, Yule, the winter solstice, and how Welsh culture plays a big part in that. Oh, gosh, yes, definitely. Yes, I do love my Yuletide traditions. <laughs> Is it your favorite holiday? So here in Wales, we have uh, a traditional form of what we would now call Halloween. So everybody mm. knows about Samhain, everybody practically. If you're interested in occultism or paganism in any kind of format, you probably have heard of Samhain, which mm -hmm. is the kind of Gaelic festival uh, that takes part, place around the same time as Halloween. And a lot of traditions that we now associate with Halloween share their origins with Samhain. Samhain, a Celtic festival marking the end of the harvest season and the beginning of winter, celebrated on October 31st. It is often associated with Halloween. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the Celtic cultures are kind of split into mm. two distinct groups. So we've got the Goidelic Celtic cultures and the Brythonic Celtic cultures. And okay. the Goidelic Celtic cultures cover areas such as Scotland and Ireland and the Isle of Man, um, whereas mm -hmm. the Brythonic Celtic cultures are places such as Wales and Cornwall and Brittany. Um, mm. And so we have like similar-ish cultures in Welsh culture, we don't celebrate Samhain. We celebrate what we call Kalan Geav. Kalan Geav, it's a lovely word. Um, so the 31st of October in Wales is known as Norse Kalan Geav, which translates to essentially mean winter's eve. And it's mm. the uh, first stirrings of the winter season. It's when farmers would have acknowledged that it's time to essentially turn over everything in preparation for the winter that is ahead. It was a time of celebration and reverence, uh, time that you know, people believed that it was more likely you might come across spirits of the dead and spirits mm. of the land wandering among you. But it was also a important time to acknowledge the uh, 
kind of ways in which our ancestors influence our lives and how they are still very much part of our everyday living life and culture. So Norse Kalangeav moving into then Kalangeav, which is on the 1st of November, which is the first day of winter within the traditional Welsh calendar. Nadolig, which is our winter kind of festive uh, period. So Nadolig is what we call the Christmas time. So there are a lot of traditions and practices around uh, Christmas and New Year specifically as well that I love to partake in. And I'm a, I'm a festive fiend, so I do like my <laughs> Christmas time. <laughs> You know so much. Where did you get all this information from? Oh gosh, a lot of it is just from growing up in Wales. So Kalangeav, for example, was something that I celebrated as a child. And I was brought up in an environment where these traditions were just everyday and common everyday things. And I remember as I grew up, I got kind of confused because a lot of people in Wales did not have the same upbringing as I did. Because um, Wales is a land that is very complicated when it comes to our history. So for example, um, here in Wales today, uh, there isn't like a huge, huge, huge amount of people in Wales when you look at it statistically that speak our native language. We're still doing very, very well. We have almost a million speakers nowadays. But when you think about like how many people actually live in Wales, it is quite low. We get people telling us that Welsh is a dead language, that nobody uses it and such. And for the longest time, I didn't realize how fortunate I was to have grown up in an environment where Welsh was my everyday tongue, my mother tongue, the language that I spoke with my family. And here in Wales, we had so many different ways that the language and the culture was suppressed for so, so long, um, to the point where there are entire regions now where the language and the culture just started to vanish. And slowly that's being picked up and such. So I started reading as many books that I could on folklore. I started speaking Mm -hmm. to people that were older than me about uh, various traditions and practices. And I started just putting myself out there as much as possible. So my, my kind of mission in life at the minute is to try and inspire people and to talk about this culture in a way that brings people towards it. Yeah, I really think that's a a beautiful mission. And if I were to go uh, into your country, what are some of the Welsh phrases that I might hear during Christmas time? Oh, during Christmas time. That's a good one. So uh, the way that we say Merry Christmas is Nadolig Hjawen, Nadolig Hjawen, which literally translates to Merry or Joyous Christmas time. Uh, And then we have Bluidin Newydd Dda, which means Happy New Year. Bluidin Newydd Dda. We have... Cavarchion Tamor or Bendition Tamor, which both mean either blessings of the season or like season's greetings, I suppose, would I like be the one. closest thing. Um, so, yeah, it, there's a lot of different phrases that kind of fly around at this time of year. But Nadoli Chawen a Bluidin Newydd Dda would be the most common, I think. <laughs> oh, very cool. Thank you for sharing that with me. So, when I started, uh, exploring Welsh culture, I came across a very unique uh, Yuletide, uh, I'm not sure if you would call it an experience, but a maybe a practice called Mari Lloyd. Would you be willing to share a little bit about what that is? Because it seems kind of scary from the outside. <laughs> Oh yes, I love the Mari. I absolutely adore her. So the Mari Lloyd has been gaining in popularity recently and I love that. I love that she's becoming this global phenomenon. It's almost like she's become the best Welsh celebrity at the minute and I love it. And she is. She is quite terrifying when you first see her. She is this spectral zombie-like horse with a white shit. Yeah, literally. So the Mari (laughs) is made out of a real horse skull. So it's an actual dead decapitated horse. Um, It's just the skull. So there's no skin or like flesh or anything Mm -hmm. like that on her. She's completely uh, just bone. And then it's a white sheet that is attached to the back of the skull. And underneath the white sheet, you will usually have a man who is very tall, stood holding a pole, which is attached to the skull. And this pole will usually have like a little lever attached as well, so that the jaw Mm -hmm. bone of the horse skull can move and like 
clap down on itself and make like a clacking noise. So it's this uh, really sinister looking thing, but it's actually full of like joy and festivity. And I love it. Sometimes you'll see ones with um, Christmas baubles or some Mm -hmm. kind of like ball inside the eye sockets. Some have beautiful ears made out of either fabric or uh, metal that's bent so like a thin copper or uh similar they'll make little ears that just look really adorable and the idea of like adding all of these adornments especially adding bells and such is so that when the mari moves around she has this swishy beautiful ethereal quality with the ribbons that wrap around Mm -hmm. her but she also makes noise she creates a lot of noise as she moves and what you'll notice is that the people who uh, kind of carry the mari who become who embody the mari itself when they are inside the sheet and they're holding the pole they'll sometimes make a shake they'll just shake the pole up and down so that you hear this like jingling of bells and she comes near you and such she's part of various traditions that we have across like the Celtic nations and also in parts of England. And you find it in even areas of Europe where at this time of year, there are various traditions where people go door to door um, in order to sing songs and share in drink and food and such. And this is just kind of our version of that, the wassailing tradition. But the history of the Marie Lloyd is quite fascinating. And it's really interesting how she's become this huge global phenomenon, considering like there are people I know nowadays who are all the way over in Australia, in Canada, in the United States, who are literally making their own maris and parading them Mm. around the streets. I've been to um, parades where people have maris and similar kind of uh, skull figures and hooded figures, as we call them here. Um, They traverse around like the streets around Christmas time and New Year's and such. But the fact is that Mari herself was not that huge of a thing until very recently. In the original like tradition that uh, this comes from, there was usually about six people in a group, a minimum of around six people. And they'd all be dressed up in various costumes and such. And they'd go door to door and they would knock on the door and they would start singing a song. So like the first verse that you'd usually hear would be something along the lines of like, Well, Dumani Duad, Gavechion the Niwad, Iovidam Genad, Genad I Gani. So that translates to, well, here we come, joyful fellows are we, and we're asking you for permission, permission for us to sing. And then the people mm. inside the house would have to return a rhyme uh, to the Marie Lloyd party and they'd have to sing back to the Marie and then the Marie Lloyd would sing back to them and it would go back and forth like this a few times until one of them couldn't rhyme anymore until they couldn't Mm. think of any more rhymes so a lot of the times they would make some of these verses up on the spot and some of the verses were traditional ones others were just made up on the spot and once the verses kind of came to an end and there were um, no rhymes left, well, something would happen. So either if the people inside were the ones who couldn't come up with a rhyme, then the Marie Lloyd would enter into the house. And if the Marie Lloyd was the one who couldn't come up with a rhyme, then they had to be turned away and gone to another house. But most people let the Marie in. Most people were just like, yeah, fine, get in here then. And once have inside... Have some wine. <laughs> yeah, have some wine, come in. Once inside the house, the Marie causes all sorts of havoc. So she'll usually uh, turn the fire off. She'll like pour some water over the fire or over, over the hearth. And then they'll dance and they'll sing and they'll play some like shows for the people inside. They will recite some songs and maybe act out a scene or something. And then the Marie Lloyd would raid the cupboards and she would steal oh. all of your food and all of your wine and all of your beer. And they would just <laughs> drink and be merry and do whatever they could to have fun. And then once they were bored, they would leave and go on to the next house. So it's this really fun tradition rooted in this one little area And then Mm -hmm. over time, as people started becoming aware of this, it migrated from the southeast of Wales. Nowadays, in the modern age, people are infatuated with this skeletal horse spirit that visits them at Christmas time. Now, I think it's lovely. (laughs) I think it is too. And I am one of those people. I'm most certainly fascinated by her. Uh, She reminds me of a folkloric figure that comes from my ancestry in Bavaria and in Central Europe known as Krampus. So 
Krampus is the the bad Santa, as some people would like to say. But traditionally, he accompanied uh, Saint Nicholas, uh, who was a saint during the fourth century. And Krampus is often a very frightening figure. He has cloven hooves, which are a reminder of Pan. He has bells and chains and a long tongue and a switch of bundles that he would swat naughty children. And on December, it's fifth or sixth, uh, depending on where you are, where there's Krampusnacht. And that is where there is a running through the town and all of the men dress up as Krampus and they, they drink and they're merry. And, and it's a lot of fun, even though it is quite scary. And I think that's what's so interesting about ancestry here is we see the darkness within the Christmas tide because there always needs to be a balance of light and dark. Absolutely, yes. And I love that um, the Krampus as well has that kind of tie to the Christmas period in like the association with St. Nicholas, because the Mary has a similar one, not to St. Nicholas so much, but okay. um, the Mary, there's like a little strange Christian folktale that built up around the Mary that associates her with the nativity, with the nativity of Christ, um, where it was said that Essentially, when Mary arrived at the stable to give birth to Jesus, um, there was a horse that was in the way. It was too it was too annoying. It was in the way. And she was also pregnant, the horse. Um, and she was about to give birth to a foal. But the people who led Mary and Joseph into the stable, they said, oh, we'll move the horse and you know, you're more important. You can give birth here. We'll move the horse somewhere else. And they basically pulled the horse out by the ropes and left her out in the cold. And mm. from there she watched the uh, Virgin Mary give birth to Jesus, but then she started wandering around looking for somewhere safe that she could give birth to her foal and she never did. And so she continues to wonder oh, and yeah. she is the Mary Lloyd. This is the perfect dovetail to talk about syncretism. I think that a lot of people in the pagan community are familiar that syncretism is where we have a mixture of cultures that come together uh, to create a new holiday. And that's really what we see in our modern day Christmas. It's a huge syncretism. Syncretism, the blending of different beliefs, religions, or cultural practices to form a new system of thought. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. And, you know, it's it's always complex to talk about it because you know, there is this narrative that gets kind of thrown around nowadays that Christmas is purely just stolen from paganism and such. Uh, and it's mm -hmm. really popular among pagan groups to, to push that narrative. And I think it's just, it's a take that is lacking in nuance because yes. when we actually <laughs> look at it, the true like way in which we have our modern day Christmas traditions and practices is that syncretism, the way in which that like, culture just blended over time. It wasn't this, you know, one singular Christian monster that came through Europe and grabbed the pagan traditions when actually it's Christian now. It was like such a more complex system of like syncretism and people clinging on to older beliefs and changing them slightly to adapt to newer times. And yeah, I, I just love it. And it's something that comes up a lot with Mary and with these traditions around this time is this question of do they have pagan origins and i always say we can't prove that they have pagan origins you know you can guess by looking at it it doesn't quite fully look christian in nature really mm -hmm. but then does it really matter because our ancestors obviously held these customs so dear to them that they've become their own thing now Absolutely. Things are not always so easily black and white. There's a lot of gray in between, particularly when it comes to Santa Claus. Now, he has quite the origin. Um, you know, a lot of people associate Santa with Saint Nicholas, who was a figure in the fourth century, but he's also similar to Odin. Now, Odin was seen traveling through the skies during Yuletide, and he had a, a sleigh and he had um, an eight legged horse. <laughs> Not quite our reindeer. <laughs> I have a bit of a obsession with Santa Claus, I will be honest, because I see I see Santa Claus as almost this new modern global deity that just kind of yeah. takes on the very spirit of this season. And so I love looking into the origins of him and such. But one thing that I really love um, to, to kind of 
bring it to a Welsh perspective because I'm obsessed with my own people is we have our own version of Santa Claus, which is oh. Sean Corn, Sean Corn. Um, and Sean Corn kind of translates to chimney pot John. That's what you would say in English is chimney pot okay. John. Um, and I always assumed for years and years and years that Sean Corn was just this um, Welshified version of the more modern Santa Claus that, you know, as mm-hmm. Santa Claus, the, um, the figure started becoming more popular in Europe and such that the Welsh were just like, we need a name for this thing that comes on Christmas Day and gives <laughs> presents and that they just gave it the name Sean Corn and that was it. Because it just kind of sounds like, you know, Chimney Pot John. It just sounds like it's the kind of name they'd give to some thing that comes down the <laughs> chimney and gives presents. But right. I started looking into it a few years back and I got really infatuated with like looking into the history of where Sean Corn comes from. And mm. what I found was a really interesting entry in a, a book from the early 20th century where a a songwriter, he writes about how Sean Corn was this completely different figure to Santa Claus. He goes on about how Sean Corn was a chimney-dwelling household fairy, essentially, a type of household spirit. And Mm -hmm. he was really obsessed with making sure that children went to bed early enough and if the be- the children went to bed early every night and they were good children and such, then this chimney dwelling household spirit would on Christmas day, leave gifts for the children. And then okay. um, they would wake up in the morning and be thankful and say it's Sean Corn, you know, that did that. And over time, this evolved so that we kind of blended that tradition with the more modern Santa Claus and made it into a thing. But like, it's fairly interesting because when we look at Santa Claus as well, there is this whole idea that he was like this jolly elf as well. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the interpretation of him um, as the jolly old man is not the only interpretation that existed through time. There's also this idea that he was a smaller elf-like figure. So it might have its origins there, but I also like to think it has its origins, the Sean Codden figure now in the household spirits and fairies that existed within uh, Celtic culture as well. So here in various Celtic nations um, over here, we have beliefs that households have their own spirit, their own fairy that lives inside, and that we have to take care of the household so as not to offend the household spirit. So the idea mm. that even our version of Santa Claus might have evolved from that fairy faith, it, it fills me with all, so much glee. I love that so much. <laughs> Yes, fairies are are very popular in the Welsh folklore. I've seen that from a lot of your TikToks. And that reminds me of the Germanic people. So there's a lot of evidence of of evergreen trees coming from the Jules traditions where, um, okay, fire hazard, please don't do this, fellow listeners, but they would take the tree um, and they would put candles in the tree in order to ward off evil spirits and evil fae. And I think that's so interesting, the difference that we see here where the fairy is considered to be a very positive figure of the household, whereas in in some traditions in the Germanic culture, it's not. Yeah, definitely. In in Welsh culture, it's kind of like, um, they're not entirely evil, but mm-hmm. you don't want to get on the wrong side of them either. Yeah. So that's why we we kind of have various types of uh, fairy-like creatures. And the household fairy was just kind of one that you had to put up with. You had to put <laughs> up with because every house had one. Um, whereas the fairies that kind of existed out in nature or the other world, they were ones that like most people did not want anything to do with. So the mm. household fairy had to be appeased, whereas most other fairies were warded away. So yeah, it, it is really interesting. (laughs) So part of your journey as uh, when did you decide that you were a witch or is that something you always felt? Oh gosh, I think there was a part of me that always had an obsession with witchcraft and magic. Um, I remember Mm. when I was very, very little and I first started primary school, um, as I mentioned earlier, I grew up in a very small rural community. Um, Mm -hmm. My school only had 26 students in total. And um, I remember the first day two of the teachers came to meet me and they looked at me and they asked me, you know, to tell, tell them about myself. And I remember the first thing I said to them was, which translates to, I'm obsessed with mermaids, fairies, and witches. And from that moment, from that first moment where I said that to them, they started pointing me in the direction of books to do with 
mermaids, fairies, and witches within a Welsh cultural context specifically. Oh. So they were they knew that I was obsessed with things like Disney's Little Mermaid and Tinkerbell and such, but they were like, hey, we have Welsh versions. You should read those mm-hmm. books. And so I'm forever grateful to them because they kind of pushed me in the right direction for that from such a young age. I also had a grandmother, which I called Nine Mumu, which translates to Grandmother Mumu because she lived on a farm Aww. with cows. Don't know how she felt about <laughs> that. I don't know how she felt about being referred to as a cow, basically. But <laughs> but she um, she was inherently quite a magical person. She lived on this middle of nowhere farm. I, I loved visiting her because I would run through the fields for hours and hours and hours. And she would tell me stories about the fairies that live on the farm and things. And she also used to read tea leaves. And so I mm. wouldn't necessarily say she was a witch because she probably would slap me if I called her that. But right. she she definitely did some witchy adjacent things like she read tea leaves and she had a crystal ball. So she was obsessed with divination and things like that. And she would teach me how to do these things. And when she died, cause she died when I was quite young, um, around like eight or nine years old. And once she was gone from my life and she was kind of my best friend in life as well, oh. I wanted something that would help me connect to her specifically that would help me feel like she was still close to me, still nearby. And I remember I had that thought in my mind when I was about 12 years old. I remember thinking, I miss, I miss my nine mumu. And I went to a little shop in a a, a town called Llangevni. And I found a book called Spells for Teenage Witches. And that was it. That was it for me. I was hooked from that moment on. I was like, I'm going to do every spell in this book. And I pretty much did for that year. And I got so obsessed that I wouldn't stop talking. That's the kind of person I am. Once I'm obsessed with something, I won't (laughs) shut up about it. And um, I was very fortunate in that I didn't grow up in a religious household at all. So my mother didn't really bat an eyelid when I told her that I was interested in witchcraft. But I did become very annoying because I kept talking about it over and over and over again to the point my mother eventually one day turned around and said, I can't deal with this anymore. I can't listen to you talk about witchcraft for one more bloody moment. Do you know that Julie Franklin, who was another teacher that worked in the school, she was a visiting arts teacher. She was like, did you know that she's a witch? And I was like, no, what? That That can't (laughs) be true. Um, And so I went on my merry little way and I walked to her house and she's the like stereotypical witch, like wise woman type person that you think of. She didn't live in the village. She lived across the bridge, about a mile out of the village in a little cottage all on her own. So like I said, stereotypical witch. I'll take that life. Thank you very much. (laughs) Oh gosh, I was so jealous. Um, And she lived in this tiny little cottage in the middle of nowhere. I knocked on her door and she opened the door and she was this very kind of domineering woman. She was, she had a very larger than life personality and she had this face, you know, the type of face where people have this face where they look at you and you just feel like they're peeling your skin and they're looking into your very soul. And I remember knocking on the door as a 13, 14 year old, I can't remember how old exactly I was. And she opened the door, she looked at me and she just went, yes. And I went, (laughs) well, and I like very breathlessly, because I just walked a bloody mile from the village, went, my mom tells me that you're a witch. Is that true? And she just looked at me and she went, maybe, depends why you're asking. And I said, please (laughs) teach me everything you know. And she did. She invited me into her house, which was also a very stereotypical witch. She had a massive cauldron in the fireplace, brooms everywhere, green men, plaques along the walls. And she was an artist. So it was also Mm -hmm. very beautifully filled with this most amazing art. And she and I grew this really strong friendship where we would go for walks together. We would travel off to like burial chambers and ancient monuments together. And she would dress in her glorious robes and she would take me to strange secret places to do all sorts of magic. And she taught me um, how to connect with the spirits of plants and how to connect with the spirit of place and such. And she became my mentor, essentially. And I Mm -hmm. loved her so, so much. And through her, I met um, the Anglesey Druid Order and the chief of the Anglesey Druid Order, Christopher Hughes, who um, is still a mentor of mine to this day. I love him to bits. And I just learned so much from them. And specifically, it was a mixture of Julie's kind of intuitive style of witchcraft 
which was very land specific, very land based, mm-hmm. very connected to the the region that we were in and the spirits of the land of that place. Um, and then Christopher's style of druidry, which was informed and inspired by the culture of Wales specifically. So he helped me to connect more to Welsh mythology, Welsh deities and such. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was a blend of these two people that kind of created and crafted me into the witch that I am today. And unfortunately, oh. Julie died two years ago. Mm-hmm. I can feel her every day. And so, yeah, she it, it was those two that really cemented me as a witch. But I guess I decided from literally the minute I could speak. <laughs> <laughs> That's really amazing. I mean, what an incredible story to be able to, to see your growth and evolution and how these people were so accepting and willing to help mold you. I did not have that experience. I grew up in uh, the Bible Belt of the United States. So, yeah. So, I it's so interesting, you know, Catholicism. We've had so many people on this show who who were born into Catholicism and then later go into occultism. And I think that for me, one of my first mentors was actually uh, my boyfriend's mother who practiced hoodoo. And that was the first time I had really ever been introduced to it. It was like hoodoo and folk Catholicism mixed together. And I was very similar. I was like, so, um, I see that you have um, some candles with some um, some some symbols on them. Can you? What are they? Can I know? <laughs> and she was so lovely, and she she owns a shop now in Florida, where she got to fulfill her dream of being able to help and heal people. And it's so we're so lucky to have people like that in the world. I meet a lot of witches nowadays and people who practice forms of magic, folk magic, occultism, and they don't have that kind of uh, figure that they can turn to and and kind of see as a support because I never saw Julie as kind of controlling or coercing my practice. Mm. She was an influence and she inspired me. And I, I really wish more people had that ability to have that strong mentor who could inspire and influence them in such a positive way. Oh my goodness, we could go down a whole rabbit hole right now about cults and 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 mentors. But I think the most important thing is that a person who is your mentor is never going to coerce you into giving absurd amounts of money, any kind of sexual favors or anything like that. Those are major red flags to watch out for. Absolutely. <laughs> so the another thing I wanted to talk about was how did we choose as a collective society when Christmas was, and it's about the winter solstice. Would you be able to share a little bit about what the winter solstice is with us? Yes, of course. So the winter solstice in scientific terms is the shortest day of the year. It's the day that has the least amount of sunlight, but significantly it obviously has been uh, an important date for humans for as long as we can trace back because there are so many different elements of history that point towards the idea that the time of year when the winter solstice takes place, which is usually around the 21st, 22nd of December, has long been a period of celebration for humans. We seem to like Mm -hmm. obsess over that time of year, don't we? And it's not something that, you know, came just from the birth of Christianity. There was, there's evidence that that in ancient Rome, they celebrated, is it Saturnalia? And yeah, Saturnalia, Sol Invictus. Very good. We know that the pre-Celtic inhabitants, so the people who lived here before the Celts, we know that they probably marked the winter solstice because of the uh, kind of megalithic monuments that we have dotted around the island yes. of Britain. So we have all these great monuments. Everybody knows about Stonehenge. Everybody knows Stonehenge. That's the like one that people instantly think of. Um, but they're everywhere. But all of these monuments, a lot of them seem to have some kind of correspondence with the midwinter sun. So the sunrise mm. or the sunset of midwinter, they seem to have some kind of feature which allows the light of the sun at the summer solstice to shine through these monuments in p- right. specific ways. For example, in um, on Anglesey, on Anismon, it's this glorious uh, henge. It is a henge similar to Stonehenge, but it also has these stone monuments. And it's now a earthen burial mound as well. Over time, yeah. the um, the monument has shifted and changed and been very many different things. It's been a stone circle, it's been just a henge, and now it's seen as a mound, a burial mound. But if you go there on the winter solstice, which I do every single year, and you sit inside the burial chamber, in the chamber that is within, and you just sit 
d- directly in front of the doorway that leads into the chamber, and you wait for a certain period of time during the winter solstice, the sunlight will pierce through the entire chamber, illuminating mm. the internal chamber to the extent that it looks like you're in a lit room, like you're in a room filled with electric light. Oh, like wow. it is just beautiful and it bathes the place in gold. And none of us know why, like mm. why this was important. But obviously it was important and it just kept being important as time went on. And obviously that syncretized eventually to becoming the date that we now celebrate Christmas. And it's it just right. over time, it's become such an important part of who we are as humans and has been since the very dawn of time. Yeah. You know, there's, there are so many mysteries that we, we may never uncover. We can only hypothesize about. And it's so interesting. So Sol Invictus, as you were talking about, was the, a Roman holiday uh, that was after Saturnalia. Saturnalia was a very big feast giving. There was role reversals, a lot of sex, a very exciting time. But Sol Invictus in Latin translates to the unconquered sun. And that's what really resonates here is it's the rebirth or the birth of the sun. Now, some people may have their little ears perk up and say, hmm, birth of the sun, like the son of Christ? Maybe, (laughs) maybe, because in the fourth century, Pope Julius I is the one who declared that December 25th was the birthday of Jesus Christ. And there was a whole big thing about when was he born? I don't think Jesus was a Capricorn. I think he was probably a Cancer, but that's again for another time. (laughs) You know, this is such a wonderful time talking to you. You're such a beautiful, bubbly personality. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm just glad to be able to talk about these wonderful topics we love. (laughs) Absolutely. And tell us a little bit about your book and where can our listeners buy it? Yes, of course. So I wrote a book and I don't know how. I have not the attention span to be able to do that. And yet somehow I've managed to do that. Um, It's called Welsh Witchcraft, A Guide to the Spirits, Lore and Magic of Wales. And it explores essentially some elements of history and folklore and mythology that is Welsh in nature. But for the most part, it is a book written for witches by a witch or for the witchy curious maybe as well. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, Mm -hmm. It's very suitable for those who either have never looked into witchcraft before and want to within a Welsh cultural context or who maybe are already witches, but they want to incorporate more of the Welsh stream into their practice for whatever reason. Perhaps you have ancestry that stretches back to Wales. Perhaps you live in Wales and you want to learn more. So the book is kind of suitable for whoever wants to learn that and also just those who might be curious about the traditions of Wales and how we might do things over here. So if you want to learn about things such as Welsh fairies, Welsh gods and goddesses, or how Welsh women used to curse people with their tits, those are all in the book. (laughs) So so yes, we're we're a very fun culture. (laughs) And it's available wherever books are sold. It's published by Hewellyn Worldwide. So if you're in the United States, you can order it directly from Hewellyn. Um, But wherever books are sold, I very much recommend going to your local bookshop and asking them to supply it or ask your local library if they can get it in. I also very much suggest that. Um, And I will also be coming up with a second book next year, Um, but I I have to be kind of hush-hush about that. So just Mm. keep an eye out. And if you want to stay up to date with me as I get around to releasing the second book. I'm Mara Starling, M-H-A-R-A Starling, across all social media. I'm on TikTok, I'm on Instagram. I'm like a rash, I get around. And once you've rubbed up against me, you won't be able to get rid of me. So you'll find oh me God. everywhere now. <laughs> <laughs> Are you too funny? So I have, I have one more question before we wrap up today. And it's about the importance of the ancestral traditions in the modern day of AI and social media. What can people do to keep these traditions alive? I think one important thing is to not see them as something stagnant. So that's something that I deal with a lot within the Welsh side of things, is this idea Mm. that these traditions are meant to stay pure and as they are, and almost like set in stone, that they can't move, they can't change, they can't shift. And that's not the point of folk traditions or ancestral practices. They're meant to change. They're meant to change over time. They're meant to fit in with our world. And it's what our ancestors have done 
done throughout all of time. Mm-hmm. And if we allow them to stagnate, if we allow them to kind of sit in the background and just be left as relics of what the people of this place once did once upon a time, they will become irrelevant and they will die out. So for example, going back to the Mary Lloyd, for example, we know that this tradition was originally only recorded to one tiny area. And some people use that as kind of ammunition to say, well, we shouldn't be doing it elsewhere then. But that's missing the point in my eyes. It's like, it has grown because the people need it to grow. And we should be proud of the fact that now it's becoming something so big that it's allowing us the opportunity to talk about the history of it. And that might not be happening if it hadn't grown and hadn't become so popular and hadn't branched out from what it originally was. So I think there's this need to have a reverence and a kind of a respect for culture in a historical sense, and yet also a desire to allow things to grow and change and shift and fit into the new way of doing things so that they're part of our everyday life rather than just relics of what once was. Um, and that might be counterintuitive to some listening who might be thinking like, how do you, how do you uh, kind of justify changing traditions in order to keep them alive? But that's the way that traditions stay alive, I think, is becoming relevant in how we need them today. <laughs> and it comes full circle because we talked about syncretism. It's about, about we're reviving traditions in order to fit into the modern age and for a way for people to be able to resonate with them. Um, we're not farmers anymore. So it's a little bit different now. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh. Again, Mara, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful. And until next time, mystics, stay magical. The Occult Unveiled is produced by F Street Productions and M is for Magic. Our executive producers are Ashley Ryan, Michael A. Simon, and Scott Kushner. Our show is produced by Deborah Simon. Our audio producer is Bill Schultz. Our talent booker is Perry Turcott. Laura Kaufman is our coordinator. Thank you for listening. And for more information on any of the topics you heard today, plus really cool links and ways to learn about Ashley, Pythian, and all of our guests, go to theoccultunveiled.com website. The Occult Unveiled, copyright 2023.